we're going to talk about springs and high water tables. This class has been a while in the making. Pretty interesting breakthrough ideas. I mean, obviously, I didn't discover water tables, but just this connection between what's going on with what people perceive to be a, a cause of water problems, either in basements or in buildings, and what's really going on, and then how to determine the best approach to solving that problem. Welcome everybody again. Um, I am Gus Ponslingo, the Leak Professor. Glad you're all here today. This is a quick overview. We're gonna talk about water tables, the clay bowl, springs, springs in Lincoln, and, and how a house really leaks, time permitting. My background, um, bachelor's at St. Louis University, went to UNL, got my master's of architecture. Um, I actually began working in architecture in 1991. That continued until about 2016, civil engineering. I'm not licensed, by the way, in either one of these. I just worked in these fields at these offices, right? So I believe in value for value. And, and the reason I do it is because I know in the future, you'll have clients that need help. And I just want people to feel confident that when they refer people to me, that they, they know I know what I'm doing, but then give them some confidence that that's going to help their client. So we're going to talk about springs and high water tables. This class has been a while in the making. Groundwater is basically what we're talking about when we talk about springs and water table issues. And it's basically the water, <laughs> simple enough, below the ground. So as you're thinking about groundwater, your perception is what are the different types of groundwater that you've experienced? Here are the various types of groundwater that I run into in some nuances. And I'm just going to run through the list. Springs well water, aquifer, something I'm kind of trying to figure out a new name for. I call it a shallow channel flow, micro spring, something like that. Reservoirs, cisterns, and I'm not going to define these now. You might know these, you might not. High water tables, water mains. Now, again, most people don't think of uh, groundwater coming from plumbing, but it certainly can. Sewers, storm and sanitary sewers, irrigation systems can create groundwater. Um, and then something a little more nuanced, and it, think of smaller scale, hygroscopic water, capillary water, and gravitational water. Most people refer to groundwater as the water table. So when you're, when you're having a chat with a contractor, a lot of times people will just say, well, we have a groundwater issue. What's your water table? Referring to groundwater as water table, is that accurate? And I say, no, water table is relative, is the, when you say water table, what you're really referring to is the relative height of the water in the ground. You're not really referring to any specific aquifer or a spring. You're just talking about the overall highest point where it's saturated in the soil. This is a common contractor picture. You'll see this on a lot of business websites. What I ask is, why isn't this a realistic water table image? But what you see is the water is really high up around... I think I can use my, my mouse here. You see my, the water's high up on the foundation. It's totally under the floor. And there's a little bit of a drain tile thing here. So um, first, the first big problem with this picture is that if water, if you think about this, so most people think of, again, a high water table, you have water around the house. If we had water that high, against the basement floor, we would have a certain amount of pressure of water pushing in. So as you would create an open oxygen space in that water plane or that aquifer, it would literally push up everywhere in the basement. And so in this picture, they're not showing water pushing in. They, they basically are trying to tell you it's going to come in around the corner and these baseboard collectors will catch it. Second issue is, and this is really, I got some pictures of this later, but when water when water surrounds a house like this, which would happen in a true water table or aquifer problem, is you'll have a ring around the basement. So when you go in and you're wondering, do I have a spring or a high water table? If you go to like the north end of the basement, you should see a, a line, like a dark line or a mold line or a, a, a kind of a mildew line, a dampness line, fungus, maybe deteriorated wood up to a certain point. And then you go to the south side, you'd see the same line or a relatively similar height. To that line. And that, I mean, obviously in this picture isn't showing up. And then the third thing is this basement would normally be flooded. Like there's just no way you could keep that much water out. So you would need a pump, which they're not showing. And that pump would probably be running nonstop, 24 7, 365. So these are a couple pictures of a house. Now these aren't the best pictures. I've got some better ones later. 
And everywhere in this house, they had this dark ring around the perimeter. And the carpeting tax strip was just pretty much shot. It, it just full of mold and going to pot. And um, the real problem area was kind of on the um, southeast corner, but everywhere in this basement was constant. And so that, that drain towel and the perimeter footing was always full of water. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about aquifers first. Um, so we got a pretty good idea. Everybody knows that um, Nebraska has a large aquifer underneath it. I'm referring to that, that's the Ogallala aquifer. And we'll talk about heights of it and whatnot um, as, we, as we kind of explore it a little bit. But an aquifer is base, basically, it's a large, large lake, or you can almost say a sea, almost it's as big as a sea um, underneath the ground. Um, and it sits in a certain type of ground or rock. And that, and that it's not really rock, but that ground can allow water to flow very quickly around or it can hold water. And so it's, it's, it's an area you can extract water out of very easily. So digging down eventually, just think of it's kind of like the type of ground where there's enough openings between the ground particles that a lot of water can sit. The smaller map here shows as the uh, Ogallala Aquifer extends to the south, it gets down to Texas. And these colors actually are showing the changes over time. We're not gonna talk too much about those except for the ones in Nebraska. Now these are aquifers around the United States. There are just a lot of different ones. We're the light blue one in the middle here, but um, there's quite a few. Florida has an interesting one that is it's super shallow around Miami and that whole southern tip of Florida, it's five feet deep. So there's no way you could build a basement there, right? So, um, but you can see also, also other parts of Florida, it's relatively deep, including some areas that's got 280 feet. So um, it varies quite a bit. Now, these are the major Nebraska aquifers and the, there's only really two to talk about, but the brownish area is the sand hills. And then the lighter blue area is called the High Plains Aquifer, where the striped area is called the Ogallala Aquifer. So Lancaster County doesn't really have a named aquifer underneath it. It does have a water table. I'm not sure if that's because the soil types are different here and they don't allow that water to flow easily. Um, this is a great image. It's a little, it's a little hard to read, um, but it's a cross section through part of the state of Nebraska. And it basically exaggerates the contours so that you can see that Nebraska from the western end slopes to downward to the eastern end. So let's try to get in. And, uh, and so as it's sloping down, there's something called a confining layer down here. And I want to show you the aquifer, the Ogallala aquifer, and then the High Plains aquifer are really, and I'm not sure if there's, I don't know where the break is in this picture. I was trying to figure that out earlier. It's a little confusing, but um, you'll see these are, um, these are points you might be able to find like the rivers through here and then this elevation. But this orange area is the aquifer zone, if you will. That's the area that's going to hold the water. But below it is something called a confining layer. And that means the water can't go down quickly below it. So that aquifer, aquifers get basically, it's got like a, a bottom to it that holds the water up. So the con confining layer is a body of material next to an aquifer with little room between particles for liquid to flow through, like a dense clay or a solid rock. And this is the thickness of the aquifer in Nebraska. So in some areas, it's relatively thin. In other areas, it's 1,000 feet deep. So in this western area, it's pretty thick. Now, if we jump out of the Ola aquifer and talk about Lancaster County cross-section, these are available if you dig around. But this is a cross-section of um, the water table and the, and the soil layers in Lancaster County. And I've highlighted the aquifer water table, height, the, the height of the aquifer, the water table, and that's the blue dash line. And so that line kind of crosses through here. And um, so there's a couple of uh, Dakota bedrock layer. I am not sure what these are made of. They may be very difficult for water to get through. Um, you'll also notice that the creeks kind of are, are labeled on here. So you can kind of get a feel for where you're looking at. This is an east-west cross section. And then these are the different bedrocks in Lancaster County. And this is Lincoln in the middle, just to give you a reference. Now the elevation of the water table in Lancaster County, again, sorry, this isn't real clear, but this gray jagged line is Lincoln, city of Lincoln. 
the blue lines are the, the water table elevation. And so these elevations are la labeled. So if you were to dig down, I think theoretically at 1200 feet, you should find water. Six, you can see it goes downward. This is 1160. And then I labeled the creeks and the purple dashed line is Salt Creek. The green line is Oak Creek. These are some feeder creeks from the west. And then Stevens Creek is over here. So when people call me and ask me, hey, what, what's the chance I have a water table? One of the things I'm looking at is what is the surface elevation versus what is the measured elevation of the um, water table or the aquifer or the water under that spot? And so I can do, I can kind of infer. Um, so again, this is 1160, so this would be 1180. So halfway in between, be 1170. You kind of start to get plus or minus of two, probably about five feet. And so what is a high water table? That's where the water surface is relatively close to the ground. So you can see in this area, there's just a shallow amount of ground and then the, the aquifer is right there. And so the table, the water table, the saturated plain is relatively close to the surface. Here's another good picture where the water table actually peaks out and you can see a little pond or a wetland here. And that happens a lot more in Western Nebraska. And some states actually have a lot of these. Now a perennial stream is usually driven by an aquifer. We're gonna talk a little bit more about this under springs later, but a water table that hits the ground and feeds a stream, stream or a wetland that eventually becomes a stream, that's one way of determining the height of that water table. So when I'm looking again, when somebody says, hey, I got a problem and I think my house has a spring underneath it or it has a um, aquifer or water table, I like to look it up and I start looking for wetlands, for creeks that are that are year round running water. I get those maps out so I can kind of find pretty quickly the elevation of the water table and then the basement elevation that determine are you anywhere close to that water table. Now, uh, when digging down, you're going to notice that the groundwater and the amount of water in the ground changes and they've called these zones. And so the top layer is just the soil zone. The second layer, which is kind of somewhat mixed, is the Vados zone. Below that is your aquifer or your water table elevation. And the Vados zone is relatively unsaturated zone between the surface and the top of the aquifer. But there can be pockets of air that contain water, or you can fill that with more water. And that's the area that will, will vary quite a bit in height. And the moisture distribution between those zones will vary quite a bit as well. But the top zone is going to have a really interesting dynamic and in that water will go in and out of it relatively quickly. So that's why like when you have a drought for about six months, the ground will all shrink. That's water leaving that very quickly and evaporating into the air. Uh, trees will pull a, a substantial amount of water out. Grass will also pull some water out. So water is being pulled out of the ground at a fairly high rate, but it also will absorb water very quickly. And that zone will vary quite a bit. Um, 50%. I'm not sure what the full saturation rate is for most ground. I think it's around 50 to 60% is pretty high before you know you consider it almost saturated. Then you got that Vado zone where the water starts to migrate downward. So you're going to find pockets of water going down slowly through that zone. And then you're going to get to an area where it's damp and it's getting more damp the deeper you go, but it's not saturated. And that's where they call it the capillary fringe. And then you're going to hit the saturated zone where the aquifer is. When dealing with water in, in experiments, you're going to see the same zones. You're going to have, like, if you were to drop water into the ground, eventually you're going to have a saturated area followed by a capillary fringe in a bold shape, and then ultimately an unsaturated or dry zone. And so um, I talk a lot about this picture in a lot of other classes because it really shows up when I'm looking in basements. The circular pattern and the spherical pattern is something I'm looking for when looking for leaks. And again, it, it has nothing to do with groundwater typically or water aquifers or water tables, but I can see that um, in buildings. How do aquifers get their water? We call it the aquifer recharge. And it comes from a lot of different things, uh, deep drainage or deep percolation. It's a hydrological process where water moves downward from the surface to the ground, deeper into the ground. There's quite a few different ways that I'll, I'll mention later, but basically rain starts the process. Um, it's naturally recharged by rain and snow melt, and to a smaller extent, by lakes and rivers. 
And then in some areas, creeks and streams will feed the um, water table or the aquifer or underground. Um, when water is leaving a stream or a creek, it's called an in. So water table formation is when water seeps down until it reaches the water table. I love this picture because it's just a nice clear, and again, another nice picture of water infiltrating and kind of getting down into the ground. And again, that water table is relatively high, it's poking up, showing a little pond or a river there. So a question I've asked many, many times teaching, but I'll ask it again. Does rain raise the water table? And if so, how much? It doesn't raise it very much at all. If we have heavy rains over the course of a year, it may raise the aquifer about a foot. So the water table is raised gradually, very slowly. I've had many people tell me, well, when, the, when it rains, the water table comes up really fast and then it goes down really fast. And again, that's not what they're experiencing, but somebody taught them that or somebody told them that. And so that's what, they're, that's what they think that's going on. Ultimately, I'll find some other problem that's causing the water to get in the basement. Now, going back to our, our state of Nebraska maps, um, there is an overall change in the height of the aquifer. And you might have heard of this because I think I've heard of this long before I really studied it. Um, and I've heard it was dropping substantially. Like I, I'd gotten the impression that the, the Ogallala aquifer was really, really plummeting. Well, in the state of Nebraska, these are the areas that it's dropping, and this is by how much. And so the dark reds, 50 to 60, the yellowish is five to 10, and then it varies between that. But I don't know if you knew this, but there are many parts of Nebraska, it's going up. And in some areas, it's raised by 20 to 30 feet. So um, I don't know in the state of Nebraska what the average would be, whether we've lost or gained some. We've got a couple of notes, and I've, I've drawn these with these little shapes here. You'll see these shapes come back up. I've got several slides. I'm going to do a little comparison here. Um, but the um, aquifer has gone down in these spots. And so we're going to look at this next slide here. Now, this is an interesting map, again, in the same study. This is the precipitation change in Nebraska during that same period of time. And then these red areas are where we had a drop. And if you'll notice that we've had a significant drop in precipitation near those areas, you know, in these two specifically. I don't know if there's a correspondence to that, but to me, that would make some sense that that might be affecting the aquifer level. Also, this is a little, a little bit smaller data. And it's changed about 20 feet in some areas, but a lot less. And again, for the state of Nebraska, I think we're doing pretty good. I think when you look at the overall aquifer change for the whole country, it's actually gone down quite a bit in, in Texas and Oklahoma, but relatively little in Nebraska. And I'm not, again, I'm not sure why. They're drilling that water out or welling, you know, using wells and whatnot, but I, I don't have personally very much experience with wells. I haven't actually had one for a house or anything. I haven't had to take care of one. I've never had to, been on a site when someone's drilled one. Because to me, they're rarely part of a leak. Uh, but if their well has been, you know, there's a nice map of all the wells in the state of Nebraska, various reading times, there are different colors represent how often the, the elevation is red. But one thing, again, you'll notice there's actually not as many wells in that area where there's drop they drop water, especially up here. I wish I had, but over here, there's an incredible amount of wells, you know. Again, you see a ton of wells right on the, I don't know what branch of the, um, I think it's the Loop River. Sorry, I'm not really good with Western Nebraska rivers, but um, anyway, quite a few on that little branch of the river there. Now, going back to our, our state of Nebraska maps, um, there is an overall change in the height of the aquifer, and you might have heard of this because I think I've heard of this long before I really studied it. Um, and I've heard it was dropping substantially. Like I, I'd gotten the impression that the the Ogallala aquifer was really really plummeting. Well, in the state of Nebraska, these are the areas that it's dropping, and this is by how much. And so the dark reds, 50 to 60, the yellowish is 5 to 10, and then it varies between that. But I don't know if you knew this, but there are many parts of Nebraska, it's going up. And in some areas, it's raised by 20 to 30 feet. So uh, I don't know in the state of Nebraska what the average would be, whether we've lost or gained some. We've got a couple of notes, and I've, I've drawn these with these little shapes here. You'll see these shapes come back up. I've got several slides. I'm going to do a little comparison here. Um, but the um, aquifer 
has gone down in these spots. And so we're going to look at this next slide here. Now, this is an interesting map, again, in the same study. This is the precipitation change in Nebraska during that same period of time. And then these red areas are where we had a drop. And if you'll notice that we've had a significant drop in precipitation near those areas, you know, in these two specifically. I don't know if there's a correspondence to that, but to me, that would make some sense that that might be affecting the aquifer level. Also, this is a little, a little bit smaller data, and it's changed about 20 feet in some areas, but a lot less. And again, for the state of Nebraska, I think we're doing pretty good. I think when you look at the overall aquifer change for the whole country, it's actually gone down quite a bit in, in Texas and Oklahoma, but relatively little in Nebraska. And I'm not, again, I'm not sure why. They're drilling that water out or welling, you know, using wells and whatnot. But And another way to put water in the ground is called cisterns. That's just basically creating an underground storage, various ways to do it. I like this picture, Oops. this picture right here, showing that a cistern is basically just a, it's a container underground. Again, that might be one there. All right, so Lancaster County water table elevation. What is the what is the general or average height of the water table in Lancaster County? It's about 50 feet. And the minimum I've read uh, I've been able to run across is about 20 feet until we get to Salt Creek. And that's the only caveat. But if you're if you're not immediately on Salt Creek or in the floodplain. Um, you're probably looking at 20 to 40 feet, maybe 50 feet or more, and you could be substantially higher, 80 to 100 feet um, above the water table. Each one of these contours is in 20 foot increments again, and the gray line, which isn't really, doesn't stand out all that well, that's the city limit. And Salt Creek is right through the middle there. So the average is about 50 feet. And if you're wondering, just a real quick way to, to kind of evaluate whether you have a high water table issue is to check the FEMA floodplain maps. Most realtors are familiar with where those are located. City of Lincoln has it on their database. Um, on the planning department side, you can go and look up your address and I'll show you the floodplain. I'm not sure if you guys have other maps that show floodplain elevations or floodplains. But this is a this is a map showing the city of Lincoln and the floodplain. And so if you're in that light blue area, there's a good chance that you're pretty close to the water table, meaning you're probably within 15 feet or so of the water table. And you could have a basement affected by it. So um, if you suspect groundwater, give me a call. I can really figure it out pretty quickly. Just a reminder. Um, and I don't charge to do that, by the way. I love to get in on those calls because typically they'll turn into a, a, a real client for me. They'll turn into something where I get to go out and figure out why the basement's leaking. But I like to just eliminate that as a possibility. So people, especially if you're buying a house and you're really curious and you're like, hey, I need to know, I'm not gonna spend any money on this. You know, can I, can I figure out if I got a water table or do I need something else? You know, is it worth, can I salvage this? You know, I can tell you pretty quick. But if you were to dig, you would see eventually a standing puddle of water. Like you would just dig this out and it would always have a constant elevation of water. That's kind of a good sign that you're, I wouldn't put a basement there. You know, that's probably a good sign. Now, is this a water table problem? Actually, I don't think so. This is probably like a heavy rain or maybe there's something that feeds some water in here, like a local um, swale, small swale. But I, this, is, this is obviously not um, a water table issue. It's just a it's a basement that maybe has poor drainage or it's getting fed by water from something nearby. Now, a good example that I did, a project in Waverly. Um, this is actually the north side of Waverly. If you're all familiar with it, this is Salt Creek, winds its way through the north side. The red box area is where I did an investigation. And the little green thing there is a pond and the house is this little gray structure right there. So this little spot of ground now, what I was able to show on this image was kind of how I do my calculations. The creek elevation is around 1087, and the basement or the ground elevation at this house is 1096. And according to the UNL ground map, the ground, oh, I'm sorry, the ground elevation is 1109. So uh, we're about 22 feet above the creek, roughly. And the basement is minus 13 feet. So they had a deep basement. To get to the to the basement that's how i did these calculations 
And, and so according to the UNL groundwater maps, the maps from UNL, they showed the water elevation at 1099. Now I measured it that day at 1096. So they are pretty close. Now, when I just a cross section through the basement, this is the foundation wall, the footing, the floor slab. What was different about this house is they had two pits. They had one pit that had a pump in it, this one over here, and then they had one pit that didn't have a pump in it. And the pit that didn't have a pump in it had standing water about eight inches below finished floor. The pit that had a pump in it was just pumping, pump, 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 like constantly. Like they couldn't keep that, like it was almost running nonstop. It might stop for like a few seconds and then it would start again. So it pumped water out constantly. So my question for you guys is what are some problems that might occur if you use a pump as this type of solution? Anyone know? Anyone got an idea? You can chime in anytime. I got them listed. <laughs> okay, they're listed down here on the bottom. First, that pump has a lot of costs when associated with electricity. Like you're running a pump nonstop and you're just pumping out basically an infinite lake of water. Uh, second is you're really not gonna change the elevation of the water under that house, no matter how hard you try. That was proven by the fact that this pit had a constant eight inches of water. Now, the other thing that we did, which I thought was kind of a just obvious no brainer thing was to just turn off the pump. I said, uh, and by the way, this is unfinished basement. Um, and it was a basement that it was excessively deep. I'm not sure what was going on, but it was, it was 12, 13 feet down to the floor on this one. So I said, let's just turn off the pump and wait a half hour, or we'll wait till it gets up to the finished floor and see what happens, whatever comes first. And so after about, I don't know, 45 minutes to an hour, cause I was outside for a while, the water never got above this elevation right here. It never ra raised up to get to the floor. So, and that was an especially wet spring. So I felt pretty confident when I told the buyer, I'm like, I don't think this is going to get much higher. Um, if you're, you know, they were kind of a gambling type of person, but I was, I wasn't there to really evaluate the water table. That's not my expertise. So I, I had a lot of caveats and I'm not taking any responsibility for that advice. I have no idea how this, but I just said, you know, my gut's telling me based on that little test we did, that that's the water plane and you're pumping all this water out. And it'd be my advice to set your pump to pump at this elevation here, just below finished floor, so that the pump is not active at the bottom of that pit because you're just, you're pumping an infinite amount of water out. So, so yeah, I don't know if that's what they did. Um, the other problem with that is there's very little safety factor. We like to see a lot of safety factors built into when we, when we put water, our buildings next to water. And my recommendation is generally to avoid a basement in that area, not to do one, especially a deep basement. So how common are water table problems when it comes to basement water leaks? This is my graph of all the, well, not, this is a lot of causes of basement water leaks. I made a nice little graph and if you read these little issues. These are things that can cause water to get into basements, gutters, downspouts, landscaping, slopes, sumps, neighbors, uh, extensions on, and then I have a little bubble here for high water table. So the majority of what I find of these things, and I've got a water table and my, my experience, my, my overall sort of like keeping track is less than 1% of basements get water from the water table. And that Waverly job is the only one that I would qualify as a water table job as a water table flood or leak or problem. And it really didn't cause the basement to flood, by the way. The reason they asked me to come out is because they had a lot of drainage issues in this basement, but they were caused by the bad drainage from the downspouts around this house. And so that was the other kind of funny thing about this is actually I was there to figure out what was going on with all the water in the basement and the water table wasn't the problem. All right. And so again, that's the only house I've ever found that had a water table problem. That doesn't mean there's not houses out there. I just haven't been called on it. And, uh, and it may be in some cities, this is a much bigger problem. Like I would say Grand Island, you know, anywhere in South Florida, <laughs> you know, anywhere that they know they have a high water table. Yeah, you're gonna have problems. But if you're in Lincoln, 
in Omaha, you're probably not going to have that problem very much. And I don't know all of Omaha either. I mean, I get called on quite a few, but I'm in, in a lot more in Lincoln. So we're going to talk a little bit about the clay bowl. I'm going to try to go quickly through this, although I have a lot of slides. The reason I cover this is because this is, a, this is another theory or idea that contractors use when trying to explain why the basement's leaking. And I want you guys to understand that, again, this is not real and it's not really accurate. Um, so we're just going to talk a little bit about, about this. So my question is, is this the clay bowl? I'd say, yeah, that is actually a clay bowl. <laughs> it's a reverse bowl, though, so it's keeping the water out. Um, has anybody heard of this concept from like a salesperson, like, you know, somebody coming out selling drain tail? I'm just curious. Maybe, <laughs> some couple maybes. Okay. Um, now you probably have never heard of Larry Janeski, but I'm thinking he's the guy that invented this theory. Because if you go back um, and you look at the timeline and, and his sort of rise in the drain tile world, backfill is a soil that's been removed. So as they dig out the house, as the foundation was dug, this is the, this is the soil that they're going to eventually have to put back in. This soil can never be as hard packed as the unexcavated virgin soil. It's looser, more porous, and is much more absorbent for water. Again, these are his ideas. Additionally, foundations intrude upon layers of natural bedrock, not in Lincoln, uh, that are guiding water to springs. So when it rains, water collects most densely in the excavated and backfilled areas around your foundation, areas where the soil has clay in it. This is called the clay bowl effect. This water is going to go anywhere it can, seeping through any opening and crack it can find its way to. If the cracks go all the way through the wall, these cracks will certainly let water through. I don't know if I got that directly off his site or if I got it from something very similar, but anyway, that's the theory. Google has a different source, but if you look up Google, they actually reference his company. Thought that was kind of interesting. Now I can I can go to like any any contractor in town any contractor in the in the state or even in the country and you're pretty much going to find the same image variations of it i mean there's a thousand variations of this image but what you're going to notice again this is um according to elon musk he used a great word the other day and i i swear this is just a great he called something like a mind virus it's when you got an idea in the public perception and it takes over and so this image is like the mind virus for basement waterproofing companies and what it shows is that over excavation right here. Again, that's where they're gonna fill up with dirt. That's all gonna be new dirt. This is the virgin hard, quote unquote, hard packed soil. And then water's gonna fill that up. You're gonna have a little bowl around your house that fills up with water. Does that make sense to everybody? It should, I mean, I think it's, that's why they made up this theory. It just makes sense it, it, and, it's, and, it, and it really sticks. It's like, okay, yeah, that's real obvious. Now, there are a whole lot of problems I run into this, but we'll get into them in just a second. But essentially, this thing acts theoretically like a perched aquifer. Um, I don't think we talked about that. We'll talk about that springs in a sense. But basically, yeah, the, like there's a small mini micro aquifer just around your house, and there's just this big bowl of water. Here's another image, another contractor. They added some cracks to the soil, made it more realistic. And then, oop. They have some hydrostatic pressure delineated there. But again, um, remember when the beginning of the slideshow, we talked about problems. Like if you have this much water standing around your basement, you're gonna have a constant water problem everywhere. On this slide, it's hard to tell, but they only have a little bit of water in this corner. This person doesn't show, or this contractor doesn't show any water coming in anywhere else. They even have drain tile. For some reason, their drain tile isn't working. So. Fascinating. I see this everywhere. Uh, this is a block basement. Again, you would never get water to stand in that block wall like that. It would push it in or whatnot. Here's another contractor image. I call this Bob's basement. This is a little simpler image, not, not quite the, the budget as the other images. Um, anyway, it's just a prevailing idea. You'll see it out there. Contractors will they'll throw it out. Makes sense. Let's move on. Let's get that drain tile going, you know, but just be careful because this really doesn't happen. Here's what really happens. And so this is some research done um, and po posted on the internet. When you have loose soil followed by dense soil, the dense soil has a higher affinity to track that water out. Believe it or not, clays have the highest affinity for water followed by a silt and then 
lowest is sand. And so what that means is that the capillary action of water on the dirt is higher. Water will gravity fall through those water openings very quickly down. But if it runs into that denser clay, it'll pull it out because the bonds that create uh, that come from water molecules to each other and to the ground around it is it, because of the tighter density of clay there's more for it to pull there's a lot of air there's nothing for it to grab onto so it just drops so water can get pulled out of loose soil by denser soil so the theory that the loose soil is going to attract the water is actually wrong it's not it's going to it's going to push the water down quickly and then that denser soil will pull it out. That's the number one problem. Um, so it can be pulled out by the cohesive forces in the denser soil. Um, there's actually a whole lot of other things wrong with this. In my experience, that virgin soils are actually pretty loose. They're not in Nebraska anyway. The more virgin the soil, the less densely compacted it is. And you can actually bring in clay as backfill and it can be a higher density around the basement foundation. And so there's a whole lot more problems in rural houses, I find, with water backing its way in through virgin soils than in Lincoln homes that are backfilled. So um, yeah, my experience is this is the opposite, that water is actually repelled by the backfill. And when it gets to the virgin soils, it's sucked in. I just want to make sure you guys understand that. My experience is this is 100% backwards. It doesn't happen and that the virgin soils have a structure in them and they haven't been disturbed. That structure is like little pillars and little tunnels and little holes um, that have created over time and they suck water in very fast. So if I put a hose over here, uh, almost 100% of that water will be absorbed. If I put a hose over here, almost none of that water is absorbed. Again, depending on the type of backfill. But most of the time when contractors use any amount of clay and they even if they didn't do that great of a job compacting it, it seems to reject water better. Okay, so now the reason we have water problems around houses is usually from the amount of water that's shed by the house by rainfall hitting it. And so your water zone around a house is heaviest right at the foundation. So normally what you're gonna find is the ground will settle quicker at the perimeter of the house because the water shedding off the house is hitting there most. It's the densest and the highest concentration of water is gonna occur right at the perimeter. Once that happens, that, a cl that collects or causes drainage to flow towards the house. And so you're gonna have a higher accelerator rate of drainage towards the house. And ultimately that'll settle, not create a, a clay bowl, but it'll just create a reverse grade around the perimeter. And that needs to be corrected about every five to 10 years. So if you have a, if you have a relatively new house, you might wanna run around and check it because that'll accelerate that'll have a faster settling, settling during the first few years as it compacts, and it will. But then as you add some more soil, that will slow down and you won't need to add so much. So it's in my opinion, clay bowls don't exist. Um, they are, what people are seeing as clay, well, water coming in at the cove joint. There's really not any sign, almost anywhere of rings around the perimeter. I mean, I almost never see that. But I think what we're really seeing um, is a something called a perched water table. It's similar, uh, but it's not the same. So if we have an issue with a, a spring, we're gonna, yeah, we're gonna talk about springs in a second, but we're gonna remember this. A perched water table can be where maybe you have a very dense layer of clay or a very dense layer of rock that allows water to flow laterally, and it might affect a house or a house or two, but rare, it's, it's actually not that common and it's, something we I kind of deal with a lot. So let's jump in and talk about what are people really seeing when they see basement problems. Let's call them springs, but I think we need a new name. I think we should call them micro springs. But we're gonna talk about what springs are and what we're seeing kind of to differentiate the two. Springs defined a point where water flows from an aquifer to the earth's surface. So think about our state of Nebraska map. If we have this aquifer and then we have what we call an aquaclude, this is where the water can't get through. Water can erupt out of the ground down a, you know, like a steep embankment and form a spring or, uh, I'm sorry, form a spring that'll eventually turn into a creek. It could be a wetland um, or something that just seems abnormally wet, even though there isn't any rain. And that's what you'll notice is that sometimes ground is wet, even when there hasn't been any rain. And that doesn't include irrigation systems. <laughs> I run into a lot of problems with irrigation systems. Now, 
Shallow groundwater seeps are called springs. A, a spring, or I'm sorry, a stream that runs year round is called a perennial stream. And that's really, I call it a spring. You know, one way to see where the springs are at is just look for the creeks that are always wet. And again, so the great picture showing the aquifer really is a creek that's always running and water is flowing into the creek from the water table. So that's why if you build near a creek and there's, there's very little elevation above the water uh, surface of the creek, there's a really good chance that if you dig deep enough, you're going to run into a water table. Um, and you'll see, you'll see water around it. Now in Lancaster County, remember this map I showed you earlier. Again, you look at the elevation of the groundwater, the water table, that's that dashed blue line. And then you look at where they note the creeks are. Notice that this, this is kind of, this is the ground, it's, it's like a hill. And then they show you the creek, that's that, like that little bottom area. Elk Creek intersects the groundwater, West Oak Creek intersects the groundwater, Oak Creek uh, intersects Salt Creek. They all touch the groundwater plain. So the elevation is the same for the creek as it is for the water table. I think this is the most fascinating map of all the maps that I showed today. But just let that, let that sink in or soak this in, is that the water you're seeing in the creeks is really the water table. All right, I just want to impress upon you. That's really clear. Now, one thing I thought was interesting is Stevens Creek, wherever they did this cut, this section isn't touching the water table. And I don't know if there's a perennial, uh, if because I know Stevens Creek is relatively short. I mean, it goes from South Lincoln to North Lincoln. And I've never walked the whole thing, but uh, I'd be fascinated to see where they cut this, you know, the section through the state to see that. Okay, we'll keep going. We're going to run out of time as always, but we got, we're just about done. We're in the last third. So I think creeks are all fed by aquifers. And again, that aquifer layer will get close. This is the state of Nebraska map. And again, I'm going to zoom in on this one. So if you see where the aquifer map and where these North Loop River is and the Middle Loop River, this is pretty close, not quite touching. But you just, again, you'll see that the rivers are actually showing you where the aquifer is. I just find that super fascinating. So this is my theory. Most springs are narrow channel flows of water that can't get down very quickly and they don't go very far. So if I were to simplify what that looks like, there's gotta be a source of water high and I call that the entry point. There'll be a path through the ground and that water will exit in some distance from the entry point. I mean, it's pretty simple. I, I use this to describe almost all leaks the area you can't see, this is the black box, the area of mystery, is underground. What is the path of that water and how did it get to here? Now we can track that pretty, pretty easy actually with dyes. There are red dyes, I think yellow dyes or green dyes that you can put into the ground and then you can use ultraviolet light to find this at the end. So if anybody understands fractals, fractals are just patterns that have different scales to them. And so you can have a short term or short spring, you can have a medium, or you can have a long spring. That's why I call them micro springs. You know, there's, there's a sense of like, they're, they're the, the distance that the water travels in the ground varies considerably based on conditions. So when you have, they call it a, a perched water table, it doesn't really have to be any specific type of clay. The water can penetrate and then travel laterally and then come out through a, a, the side of a hill almost anywhere. So again, just the, the name of this is really, we don't really have a good name for this, but I call them micro springs, but they're not true springs because they're not the water table coming up. It's just water trapped before it gets to the water table traveling laterally. So the great image, aquifers are usually deep, springs are pretty shallow. Now, how, does, how do they form? And again, this is the real key to my investigation is like, where did the water come from? And if I can't find a source, then I'm not going to claim it's a spring. I might try to figure out some other source for the water, but I really need to figure out where did the water go into the ground at? So the infiltration spot. Again, this is like a puddle in the ground. Again, another seepage, some kind of structure that could be built. I'm going to jump through these pretty fast because there's a lot of them that are similar. Another, another source of water are wetlands. Wetlands can form local springs, small springs. They can feed the water table, but they can also be a very short distance. Man-made structures underground, you're seeing this more and more. 
I caution, I caution you to let, you know, before you let the city do some kind of new creative ground water infiltration system near your project, make sure it doesn't, it's not uphill. Call me, actually, just call me. We'll figure out what, what, what needs to be done. Nobody's studying this, you know, nobody's aware of this. And the reason I say that is because I'm called out on jobs and I know nobody, I don't even know who to send people to. You know, if I knew somebody that was really into this more than I was, I'd send them to it. So um, I like to troubleshoot these things before they get too far down the road. Um, you yeah, have a detention pond, be careful. You know, they usually build these with clay bottom because they're going to hold water, but they may not. Um, if you have a local, this could be a wetland or a sump or a sink, it could lose water underground. Just your backyard. I mean, if you dam up water in your backyard and you have a really soggy backyard, that could be feeding your micro spring. Rain gardens, you know, those are real popular. I'm not sure how popular they are this year, but about three or four or five years ago, the city was paying people to put rain gardens in. And I was getting called to fix the basements that were leaking. <laughs> I, could, I could track a rain garden to a leak, you know, and again, you can test this pretty easy with dye. Uh, neighborhood drainage. You know, I show this picture. This is a real world example. Um, this person had a lot of bad drainage, but this area near their house was a sump or a sink. You know, water was big puddle. Water would sit there. Again, they also had a berm here trapping the neighbor's water. So that's going to create a spring in their, uh, in their basement. These are some other things to be really cautious of. Um, I guess the dike one you can kind of forget for a second, but the big bad one is French drains. You know, a lot of people are, I think French drains have had a new resurgence in popularity. If you go on YouTube, there's, you know, any number of French drain companies out there with promoting these are the, the, the end all be all. They're just going to create a spring. So under no circumstances, put a French drain in near your house, especially uphill. Got a great story. I don't have time to tell it about a French drain that caused this interior of the house to collapse. Retaining walls, actually, retaining walls are really problematic at creating micro springs. And then landscape beds, you know, that's the perennial problem. That's one I deal with a lot. The house here is the house in question. Now, once upon a time, a swale flowed down this golf course across the road and caught a bigger creek here. The swale currently was rerouted to go around the back of this house so that they could add another lot. And what's happening is the water doesn't recognize this swale. It, it's too flat for water. It, it's it's under, under sloped, I guess. And so the water decided, I want to go where I used to go, under the basically in that old creek bed. And it kind of intercepts the corner of his house here. And so if we look inside his house, this is right, you can see the mold on this back panel, all the mold and mildew, but you see the ring here and the dense moisture here, that's prevalent around the entire perimeter of this guy's house. And his pump runs nonstop, 24-7, 365. And so I can't remember, I've had actually two calls in this house, but I can't remember what I suggested he do because I think the only way to solve this problem is to intercept the water before it gets to the house and to try to, and try to kind of create a, a drawdown zone so that the water isn't getting to the house in any high amount and then creating what would be a natural drainage, a gravity fed drainage, at least out and over. And again, that would be very difficult to do depending on how bad it affects the, the house. Otherwise you're left with pumps. And I know, I know there's, there is a good solution with pumps. It's just that it's expensive to run that pump all the time. And you would rather have that water be gravity fed down. So again, does anybody remember the name of that? Oh, Pine Lake. Pine Lake, yeah. Is that what it's called? Just Pine Lake? So there you go. That's where the name of the street comes from. <laughs> okay. All right. The next one is, I never thought of that before. Um, hey, Jess. Yeah. Um, Donna also asked a question just about the springs in the streets near Superior Street and wondering if any research had been done by the Department of Roads based on how Tell it's me wet where on and Superior then in the winter Street. it turns icy. Yeah, what part of Superior Street? Um, we can narrow that down to us, like a, a section of land. I think um, towards 22nd by Campbell Elementary. 
20 second. Let me come back to that one. I'm going to get through these couple examples and then I'm going to pull up Google Earth and we'll, we'll actually specifically look at that one. Um, anyway, so 40th Street. So this is a house that I get calls on every two, three years. And that's because whoever buys it decides to sell it. And then the next person buys it and goes, hey, what's wrong with my house? So that's the address right there, 2729 South 40th Street. <clears throat> there is a usually a, a bunch of water running down the curb here. That's because the pump never stops. That's what it looks like. There is a drain line here. It used to come out somewhere around here or here and the water would flow down the street. And what's going on in this house, again, it's, it's affected by a, a local spring and I've narrowed the spring to this path here. And the reason I, I, I surmise that's where it's at is because you can kind of see the contours feed water to the north through this area right here. Now this is curiously, uh, I think it's Southeast High School. And so this area is the track and the ball field. And I think what's going on is that there's probably some drainage in and around. You can kind of see this is the beginning of a swale. That doesn't look like there's a wetland there, but it's possible that water is slowed down enough. It's a Whenever you drain around a ba uh, baseball, football field, whatever, there's such a long distance that you really have to have a decent slope. They could, this could be a high infiltration zone that collects water into the ground and feeds it right to this house. So I find this to be a really fascinating one just because I deal with it every couple of years and they really can't figure out where the water's coming from. Again, it could be right around this perimeter and then again, this is my general theory on where the path of that spring is coming from and into that house right there. So again, when I'm, when I'm trying to figure out, well, is it a spring? Does it have a reasonable source of water that could feed it? And in this case, this is a big enough area that's flat enough that I would say, yeah, that seems pretty reasonable to feed a spring. Now, the other thing is these, this white line is the um, basin line the brake line, the ridge line that would prevent water from traveling. Oops. This would prevent water. Water can't travel across this line, not on the surface. So, and those are things that you map out right away. You need to figure out where your ridge lines are. So this water would all travel to the north. This water would travel to the north. So we're dealing with a very narrow basin. And a basin is really, you gotta, you gotta look at your, your, your creek has to be fed only from within a certain distance. And that is basically based on the ridges that would push water towards it. And conversely, if it doesn't feed, it would push it away. So that's a ridge line. And so I've mapped that ridge line out. All right, so anyway, it's just a fascinating house. You may run into it, you may show it. Um, now you know what's yes. going on with it. Um, unfortunately, you know, when you sell a house like that, you gotta, you gotta take into account, yeah, that's a serious problem and there's no easy way to fix it. Now, Fallbrook, oh, can we have the slides? I can give you some slides. Let me know which ones you want. Uh, you want all of them. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll think yeah. about it. Um, it's a lot of work to put these together. So I just need to know what you can do with them, I guess. Um, Fallbrook. Now, the fascinating thing about Fallbrook is you can't get much higher in Lincoln. The ridge line or the house in red here is the street. And water on either side is going to flow away or flow, you know, opposite, you know, perpendicular to each other. So this house has no way to be fed water from anywhere other than itself. So what happened with this house? This actually had some hallmarks of a spring, which meant the pump ran forever, constantly. So this is a more specific, this is an, a more recent picture showing the um, aerial photograph. And you kind of see it a little bit right there but that is a large landscape bed. But anyway, the ridge line is in the street, meaning water is going to flow down and away. So there's nowhere for water to get to this house other than his neighbors, which is right here, and maybe his neighbor's neighbors. And again, they drop down and away. So anyway, um, this is, I did a calculation of the amount of water that could get into this. Um, <clears throat> um, it's double retaining wall. And in a three inch rain, they could have a thousand gallons. I figured there was actually water coming from the roof, so you could probably double or triple that. And so basically it's forming a nice swimming pool. And this is what it looked like in section. <clears throat> it's a double retaining wall system. 
and it was pretty much all rock. So water, once water got into the bed, it just went to the bottom and it filled up. And this is an actual picture of it, the double retaining wall. And the pump was located back towards the house. And so because they made it flat, you know, they were make the retaining wall generally flat at the base, that water could get back to the basement. <laughs> so they had a big swimming pool that was tied to their basement drain tile system. Crazy, I know. But it, it's not a true spring. And this is kind of what you need to do to figure out, well, am I, especially was, I would say it had all, it had a lot of hallmarks of a spring, which means the pump ran constantly. I can't remember if there was any um, planes or lines of water, but it was just really, it was really odd. And until we calculated how much water was in that, <clears throat> and now it was all connected to the basement, it was hard to, it was hard to tell. Now here's another one, a, a lot, I think a fair number of people get to, you know, encounter because it goes on the market pretty quickly. This is a uh, Southwest 26th Street. And I did the slides out of order. So I'm gonna jump, this is what you see in the street. And you used to, I think they, dra they ran the drain pipe somewhere else now, but it used to have this nice algae all in the, the curb and gutter and on the street. Well, the drainage it usually it used to be and originally was like a cross sheet drainage from the field into the creek, the little creek behind the house. The white is the house location, and it was just very, you know, flat, not not concentrated. Well, then what happened is they built a subdivision and they have this L-shaped block that's downhill. And so the swale that handles, again, this is common subdivision design practice, is you push the water to the backyard lot line unless there's a decent cross slope where you can bring it between the buildings. And I don't remember if this goes all the way to the end or not, but this corner is now the swale. And this poor guy, it probably has water in his basement too. But anyway, so this water comes here, it has to work its way around the, between these two houses. It's a horrible design. It should look like this, but they, you know, everybody wants to sell another lot. So, you know, um, this water then hits this house. This is the house that had horrible spring problems. So this is initially, this is early on, and you can count the number of fences here, by the way, one, two, three, four. Well, fast forward 10 years, and probably this is old now, but I counted almost 20 fences in, in a very short period of time. And what they told me was that the spring was getting worse over time. Like it seemed to always get worse. And I, this is where I track human activity to the formation of springs or you know the potential for springs and so what people are doing is they're building fences and they're building retaining walls and they're building gardens and they're filling up their backyard you can see gardens here you see little structures here and every time somebody does it they end up running into usually what will happen is somebody will accidentally dam the swale and then everybody's reacting to excessive water in, in the ground and so people will start to it's almost like um, uh, arms race you know one person will do one thing the next person next thing next thing you know you have this moat around somebody's house and no water can get anywhere and it's all going underground and i'm guessing that's probably what happened is that this water was pushed underground well it still wants to track and it's got to go somewhere downhill and this is the poor guy that gets it so i showed this this initial image where was it at no no it's the last one sorry this last image shows this is the track of water, I think, and it just hits that poor guy's house. So in order to prevent that, the subdivision and the neighborhood association has to get in early and they have to make a designation for this swale so that the water surface drains all the way to the street. You don't want that water going in the ground. Otherwise, it's just gonna travel laterally and it's gonna hit somebody downstream. So, um, and, and that's just not happening. The other thing is to not make blocks so long so if you have a long skinny block, like 30, 40 houses, and water will just accumulate in the back rear lot. It just really has a hard time draining down that swale. Um, in the older part of town where you don't have these types of issues, that's because the blocks are smaller. <clears throat> Usually you have a double block or a single block and, and you'll even have an alleyway and that'll help drain that water on the surface and it doesn't create springs. So, um, and uh, basically I'm, I'm the first person that has, I think I have a business model about solving these problems that helps me constantly get back to the solution. So my profit motive isn't construction, it's really on, on being accurate. You know, So the more accurate I am, the less likely I am to have a client call me back 
the less likely I am to go back for free, you know? So there's a real motivation for me to figure out what's going on as opposed to the broad industry business model, which is the more construction we do, the more profit we make. And so in general, that's what I feel like has happened is that the construction industry is, tra is trailing or lagging in the solution because there's not a, the more accurate they are, usually the smaller the job. And so when you're doing these things, you know, you got to make money. I'm not saying they're lying or anything like that. I'm just saying there really hasn't been any strong motivation to solve water problems until I came up with this sort of business model that actually makes money solving the problem, you know? So that's my epiphany. Maybe, maybe I'm right app. And then we're going to maybe deal with some real world examples here. Okay. Hey, Jess, remember to pull up a map here and go back to the Campbell okay. Elementary 22nd and Superior area if you can. Can you guys see that Google Earth image? And you can turn on, there's not that many of you, so you can put on your um, your microphones. But I think we're talking about here. Is that right? 22nd. Is it 22nd? Uh, yeah. 22nd this guy. and Superior near Campbell Elementary. Let me see. What is that? I don't know if that's Camel and I don't. Donna, does that look right? I am not sure if it's Dodge Street in front. That's the actual address. Is yeah, I think that's correct. Okay. Yeah, and they've got a lot of turnaround school on Superior there, and you you can sling around just instead of turn around sometimes because it's ice. Then it becomes ice. Where's the, the Where's the problem at on Dodge Street? No, on Superior. And they and they they have little turnaround things, uh, yeah. So that's kind of it. And I live at the top of North Hills or whatever. And and Campbell used to be my school that I teach at. And so I'm familiar with all the seasons and everything. And it it looks like the street weeps. Oh. And is you say it's Superior Street that's weeping? Yes, yes, in more than one spot. Hmm. But I just felt as though, why do you not fix it? You know, or <laughs> maybe you can't, I don't know. Right, right, right. Well, concrete weeping can occur as water gets under the joints of the concrete, and then it'll travel usually with the, the slope of the concrete downhill. And so Boy, I would, I would first look at where could concrete be absorbing water? Because it could be just that the concrete needs to be maintained by caulking the joints or repairing the joints if there's big holes or inlets around openings. Um, and sometimes the, the actual storm sewer will be, will be, um, will go downhill. Like it'll, it'll start to fall apart and water will flow under the slab that way. Um, that's what I showed up in this recent Omaha job where the water was coming out through the slab and the whole, it was a big parking lot. And, and I did this at High V, another video I did. I actually posted that one on my Instagram, but the high, the high V parking lot over on uh, 48th and O Street, roughly, uh, just, just to the east of there, um, I show water coming out the slab. And it's because at some point, the water is getting under the slab and then traveling, later, traveling, traveling laterally downhill, and it'll come out wherever the storm inlets are near. So um, if you could, if you have any pictures of that, so I can zone in, I mean, zoom in on exactly where that's at. When I'm out there, I will drive around and see if I can spot what you're seeing. 14th, North 14th. I know my husband always goes into the different lane because, and I'm like, why are you doing that? Well, he doesn't want his car to get dirty in the water or whatever, because it's constantly. How far, yeah. How far north? Um, it would be, it's like the back way out by that, um, Ukrainian church on North 14th. Could be that one. So really close to, yeah, where you've got it. Yep. Yeah. It's about three houses in from that corner on Morton there. Morton, Morton, Morton. Here? Three okay. houses north. Yep. Right around there. Huh. Okay. You know it too. Yep. <laughs> That's a little different because it's a pavement problem. I could say because the pavement acts as storm sewer, they, it all of a sudden starts to make it maybe not a groundwater, but just a, um, a storm sewer 
Now that your basin, you talked about the basin, I wonder if it's from up the hill where it just goes ahead and comes down there and comes out in that area. I don't know. Yeah. Well, there's a long way down. I mean, either side, uh, it could be coming, I, I, depending on where that, it's like there, uh, this is again, these, these elevations aren't super accurate, but you know, it looks like there could be a little rise there and a ridge there. It could be coming underground here. <clears throat> okay, this is the follow-up and I did do a little bit uh, research and we showed you some pictures the water is leaking out the street and you can see it pretty clearly right here on Google Earth. There's a little bit of a streak right there. Water comes out and then cars drive through it and they kind of drag it. They drag it up the street here. And so first thought, you know, when I was looking at that, one thing I really couldn't tell was elevation and relative height. So there's a lower area along the east side and then there's a wetland here and there's another wetland there or small pond that it filled in and that all drains out and down to the east and north, so northeast. And you'll see another tributary joining and they end, end up going to Salt Creek. Coming from, uh, from the east and, sorry, from the west and south, there is a swale that goes across the church parking lot and there's gotta be an inlet somewhere. There's certainly one here and then I believe that crosses either into the city storm sewer or into a storm sewer outlet on this side. You can see that other Swaler Creek is, gets larger as we go this way. Then second, or additionally, this lot, or block, and all these lots actually drain uh, east and, uh, well, straight east through the backyard here and again there. Now. There may be an inlet here. This may go into the street. This may have uh, increased infiltration rate. Um, we should be seeing problems in these houses here. We also could have issues with the standing water on the back of these lots through here. This is a flat area and actually drains downward to here. But the water generally wants to drain um, in a northeasterly direction across the street with this point being an interception point. So we have, we have a key lot here. We have two blocks that drain this way. So my initial investigation would be to look at the back of these lots in that block and the back of these lots in that black and block and then all along the west side of 14th Street and then maybe up through here on the north side of this church where this water could be draining and coming out over here. But uh, what I did know, and again, I don't think this is a part of it, is that this swale comes around, comes across, and then drains to the northeast over here. And I didn't know that when we were doing this initial, just sort of out of the blue, what's going on. This is a very complicated drainage area. And it really doesn't surprise me that we've got water coming out of the ground here because we've got all these converging um, tributaries. We've got one here. We've got one around here, across there. We've got, um, we've got one coming through here. And I'm sure this is all tied into this somehow, you know, all this storm sewer over here. So the spring is coming out in the street. Uh, very interesting. A customer that had their house was collapsing so it really wasn't a leak and I was like well I can tell you if it's groundwater or not and I went out I did an evaluation they're really high I said no groundwater but I think it's coming down either it's a plumbing problem like your plumbing line is leaking from the city and according to another plumber he goes water can even travel on the outside of that pipe and flow back in so you can get water from the city main like water gets trapped around the city main and then it flows down an individual's pipe into their house and so crazy as that is, we couldn't get the, the stop to turn off and the guy didn't want to dig it out, spend a thousand dollars. So, <laughs> so that was the end. I mean, I couldn't tell him anymore. I'm like, we can't go any on. So he, um, somebody else came in and said, it's groundwater. And they gave him a drain tile system. And I was like, ah! <laughs> but it could be similar. Like, you know, it could have been water from the street getting into, you know, infiltrating into the, into the, the water line is actually pretty high so that water main is only using about five feet deep. And that could throw, that could flow water laterally pretty easily. Yeah, Gus, yeah. I've got one on Northwest 53rd and Adams. And she has a standard sump pump, which ran only when it rained. And then all of a sudden, different area of the house, it started coming up under the basement floor and flooding our basement. So somebody with great expertise came in and just planted a pump right there at that spot. That pump, we'll call that pump number two, the new one, was running 
constantly to the point they had to put in a backup because it would pop the breaker. For some reason, that one, number two pump, has now slowed down to not pumping at all, but number one pump, which never went off until it was raining, now number one pump, the original, is going off. It stops for three seconds, and then it goes back on. Okay. Tell me, how close are we to, I got a, I've got a marker on the map. Um, her actual address is 2720, Northwest 53rd. Okay. 2720. Search. Oh, okay. Hmm. Boy, let me do something here. I think I can do. So this is another thing, nice thing about Google Earth. I'm showing you my secrets right now. So you can go to the time machine. There's a little button up here, show historical imagery. And I have that turned on actually because it gets rid of the 3D elevations for the house. So I'm working in, in a three to one exaggeration of the, of the elevation model. And so if I go back in time, nope, too far back. So right away, Well, this ground has some strange contours in it. Looks like they already show the, the elevations for the streets. Um, they have a significant swale. Boy, I don't know. She's in a she's in a danger zone, but I'm not sure how. You know, sometimes you you can see the creek goes through here. And again, she, the second thing is a new danger zone, which is you've got these large blocks, if you will, that kind of drain towards her house. She seems like she's relatively high in this spot. So it's, do you know what side of the house the water gets in on? Uh, north. Well, the new pump was on the north. Yeah, this one, I can't see, I can't really confirm by looking at the map that she has a spring. I can't rule it out, but I can't confirm it. It doesn't have, it doesn't have what I would say, like a lot of the hallmarks. It's got some fuzzy, you know, it's kind of like where you, you might see something. Looks like there might have been something this way around, but at the same time, I don't know what her elevations are. So it's possible, but I wouldn't certainly, I wouldn't say absolutely. Hmm. So I would say there's maybe a 25% chance that there's a spring affecting her house directly from what I see here. And if not, then, so what I look for is other sources of water. And that's where I go out and I do my investigation. And so what I'll be looking for is I'll be looking at site drainage around the house. I'll be looking at how does the house drain? How does the neighbor's house drain? Is there anywhere, anywhere nearby that could be forming a reservoir? And reservoir is like standing water underground. So sometimes people will inadvertently create reservoirs near their house. And um, I'd be looking for that. So, with all the pumping though, that definitely leans towards a spring. Um, and again, so that's where it, it gets a little confusing. Um, and this is where man-made issues kind of conflict with natural, but I don't see it on the natural side. This map is more natural. We're looking back in time to what was there naturally. Looks like the spring or the creek, if you will, flowed around it. Doesn't look like there was any swales that fed it. Again, when I see when I see springs, I usually see a swale running through the house. The developer just covered with dirt. So, and your comment on the water main leaking—that was one of our possible questions too. Was whether there was just a pipe leaking underground? Yes, 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 yeah. That's the okay. So the really frustrating thing about a water main leak is it mimics it mimics a spring leak uh, or a spring because um, you're going to have water all the time. So man, and those are, I, I tell you the most frustrating leaks to get involved with because between the house and the street, um, it's almost like no man's land. You know, you take, it takes a lot of special equipment to figure those out. Um, they're tough, so. Thanks for watching this video. Uh, it is a class, I teach many others, I'll be posting more. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel as well as Instagram and 
LinkedIn and Facebook. I'll provide those links somewhere for you to see or just Google or search for me. Uh, and again, if you have a leak and you want me to help, whether you're here in Lincoln, Nebraska or somewhere else far away, I can help via phone consultation and the rates will change. But depending on what my website says, that's what I usually charge. So anyway, thanks for watching and we'll talk to you soon.